hello hello welcome back thanks so much for joining me so I'm excited we're back for another bachelorette video so last week I actually didn't end up posting a bachelorette video um, I did a really cool I think it's I think it was cool I think it was fun I had a lot of fun filming it but I did a breakdown on the new cast announcement from the new season of Love Island. So if you haven't checked that video out yet, I will link it up there if you wanna go ahead and watch that. Uh, quick <laughs> quick Love Island update I've been watching. So the season has started in the UK, in the United Kingdom, but we can't watch it here. I heard that the first episodes will be released on Hulu starting July 12th. So we still have a little ways to wait, about 10 days, but not too long, so I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I've been watching along on Instagram with all of their stuff and I'm getting very excited to see actually what happens in all the drama. I'm trying not to like find out who the recoupling, I, I could not stop myself. I, I saw who the initial couplings were. I just, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't resist. I watched like the IGTV video and I was like, who oh, couples up together? I'm so excited. Anyways, um, so check that video out. I thought that was cool. And then the second reason I didn't do a Bachelorette video was because truly episode three and episode four, it's, it's one, it's one week. I thought it would just be better like to talk about them all together. I hope that makes sense. I don't know, whatever. But that's what I decided to do. So if that sounds interesting. Um, I have some new things thoughts about editing, about how the show is trying to craft the storylines. I have some new, well, I have a lot of new thoughts because we finally get to see Blake in action and I think his edit is very interesting. V interesting. So if you want to see all that, if you want to hear me talk about weeks three and weeks four, or episode three and episode four, because you know, a week, a week in Bachelor, in the Bachelor universe is really like four days. So <laughs> So when you say all oh, these people have been together in 12 weeks and that was so fast that they like know each other 12 weeks and they're already getting engaged, it's not really even 12 weeks. <laughs> Anywho, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> I don't know what was that with my hands, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. And um, before I forget, if you like this video, if you like seeing these kinds of videos, you can give it a thumbs up. If you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that, okay? That'd be cool. All right, let's go. <laughs> Let's get started. So a lot has happened. So start of week three, episode three, was really the end of week two's rose ceremony. So Carl, if you don't remember, Carl has just come out of the blue and been like, not everyone he is here for the right reasons. Like remember Cody, how you sent him home? Well, there's other people here who are not here for the right reasons. And now looking back at it, I wonder if like Carl was talking about Thomas, but I also feel like Carl was just making this up. But I don't know if we'll ever know. Maybe one day Carl will like come out on somebody's podcast and and, ta and say like, yeah, I just straight up made it all up because I wanted to make myself look better. I don't know. <laughs> I literally don't know what Carl is doing. Both in the scene where he's like boxing nobody and just like, what was his plan? Like, I felt like he was trying to play this strategically. Like, it felt like he was on an episode of Survivor and was trying to be strategic in like spreading lies and starting rumors, but he just was so dumb about it. Like, he didn't even do it well. And then when the guys called him out on it, he's like, well, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. It was just weird. And intense. Don't be a fibbing friend. Carl. Oh, Joseph Smith? Because a lie is a lie. It's not a lie. The best part of the night was, was Justin's faces. Justin continually provides the face. Like, it is amazing. Anyways, so all of this drama's going on. Everyone's like, what are you talking about, Carl? Uh, Katie's upset. The producer is sending Greg to like calm Katie down and like get her to keep going on with the night. And she's like, okay, I can't continue with this cocktail party. I'm too upset. We're gonna go right into the rose ceremony, which of course always upsets all of the men because they're like, I didn't get time. I didn't get to talk to her. And so everyone's stressed and freaking out and worried. So they're going into the cocktail party and it finally is time for Mike. And he accepts his rose and then he steps back and he's like, Katie, I just feel like on behalf of all of the men here, we want to let you know that we think Carl is full of hooey. <laughs> he's making stuff up again. You're making things up again, Carl. Oh, no conscience. We don't feel like this is actually true. So Katie, of course, thanks him, but then she's upset. 
runs away, talks to Kay and Tay, and is like, oh, what do I do now? I thought I was gonna keep Carl. Like, I don't know what I should do because originally I planned to keep Carl tonight. Hmm. Which surprised me, shocked me. I know Carl got a fairly good edit night one, and it seemed like he and Katie had an okay like connection, but then in the second week, you didn't really see Carl too much. And then like, I was just was surprised that she was like, oh, I was definitely gonna keep him. And I was like, ooh. So I guess the moral of the story is, <laughs> if you want to stick around, don't be shady like Carl, but go and tell Katie that like other people are not very good and then she'll keep you. Maybe, maybe that's where Trey got his game plan from. Hmm. <laughs> so Katie goes back into the rose ceremony and is like, okay, we'll continue. And she keeps giving out roses and then it gets down to the final rose and it's between Aaron and Carl. Who is she going to keep? It's Aaron. <laughs> she sends Carl home. She sends Carl packing. Everyone's happy. The good guys have won. The bad guy was sent home. All is well and right in the world, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> For a minute, that is. And then it's the next day. It is group date one. And this is the date that was hosted by Nick Vial that we saw in the trailers. And this was a really interesting group date and something that they don't do I've seen similar dates like this, but it, it did feel a little bit different in that the contestants were sharing pretty personal things about their lives in this kind of setting. And so Nick was talking about, you know, we need to make sure everyone's here for the right reasons. No one's here to like try to make a platform out of this. So I'm here to hold you guys accountable. Today is about being truthful and sharing with Katie the things that maybe we're not so proud of. Someone trying to be? Next Bachelor. You know the producers like fed to him. <laughs> you know they fed him this line because they knew what was coming. All the men are here, they're kind of sitting around in a sharing circle and they're talking about past relationships. All the guys share the kind of the two main men that we focus on in this date. The first one was Hunter, which was really interesting that we got to hear a little bit more from Hunter because we really had not heard too much about his personality or his personal feelings. He was just kind of used again as that face, the reaction shot, the narrator for a lot of these, these, well, a lot, <laughs> the past two episodes. But in this group date, we actually get to hear from Hunter how he talks about how his first marriage failed and he kind of got too focused on trying to provide for his family. And by the time we had my son, I had just completely shifted priorities. You know, I, I justified it by saying that I had to work because like, I wanted them to have everything. Which I think is really an interesting conversation to have about if we're going to continue to push people towards these heteronormative, you know, marriage, family kind of living situations, and yet our economy doesn't fully support people in order to allow them to have this life, this, this idea of the American dream that we were sold in, you know, the post-consumerist, you know, 1950s, um, post-industrial age and how I mean this is a whole other story it's, it's actually really interesting I read this really really great book which I will link down below if you're interested it's called The Way Things Never Were and in this book the author actually talks about how in the, even in the 1950s uh, people felt a lot of pressure you know this idea of keeping up with the Joneses that wasn't even really fully attainable in the 1950s this idea of trying to keep up with the Joneses and the marketing that happens in you know, to buy all these consumer goods and like especially to get all the appliances and like buy the cars and buy the house and buy the microwave and the television and all this stuff. There's another really good book too. It's called um, Television in the Family Circle, but um, that, that kind of talks about the importance of television and touches a little bit on this idea of how uh, media created this idea of the perfect family life. Um, but I think it's just interesting that Hunter's basically talking about that. He was fed this idea of this is what you should do with your life. You need to get married, start a family, provide, be that strong male provider for your family, and how the pressure of trying to keep up with that really was detrimental to his life. He did not have a better life and actually ended up causing his marriage to fail. But it's so catastrophically ironic because I was destroying all of that while I was trying to build it. And, you know, I think it was really touching how he talked about how it, he felt like a failure for himself, but also felt a lot of guilt for putting his children through this. And I think there's a lot of, you know, self 
reflection going on on his part to be able to talk about that. So I thought that was really, really interesting to hear all of that from, um, from Hunter. And then everyone else kind of shared their stories. I can't remember. I think Aaron said something about his father being sick. But it wasn't, it wasn't really highlighted too much. Um, and then there was this really weird moment with Thomas. I think there was some more Justin faces thrown in there where Thomas was just talking and talking and talking, basically saying that he came on the show and he wasn't really there for Katie initially, which while I think is weird that he would say this on a group date with Katie in the room, it's actually not weird. So when they do the casting for the show, oftentimes, you don't know who the bachelor or the bachelorette is going to be. It hasn't been announced because they are casting, you know, kind of far out. Um, they do do more pinpointed casting later on. Like in, I think, yeah, it was in this last week's episode, they actually had a little preview that says, if you want to date our next bachelorette, Michelle, apply at abc.com slash casting. And so they, because they've announced that Michelle's going to be the next bachelorette in the fall, they already ca are casting specifically for her in the next season but oftentimes you don't know you just apply for the show and they ask you during the your audition process like or audition you know whatever interview process who would you like to see as the next bachelor or bachelorette who do you hope to be on here what kind of person are you attracted to and they ask those same sort of questions to the bachelor and bachelorette like what what's your type like what kind of people um do you normally date or would you like to date but so that's not unusual for Thomas, but it was unusual that he said it with Katie. Then the thing that really stuck out to me, which was like a red flag, he said, I have a lot of red flags and I'll be happy to talk to you about them. Any red flag that you want to know? Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you any secret that I've ever had. Um, there's people who I've let on. I went on a date like the week before I left because like I said, I came in just not knowing. Just like, okay. <laughs> I mean, maybe he went first and didn't know that other people would be opening up and sharing a lot of personal details about themselves. And so he kind of didn't, maybe he didn't feel comfortable getting into important things. But the way it was framed was like, every look at everyone else sharing these really heart-wrenching, tough, you know, life-defining moments and then Thomas is like, oh, I have red flags, but I'm not going to talk to you about it. And also, I wasn't really here for you. I thought this could be, you know, good for me. And I was open to the experience, but I'm really happy that I'm here. But, you know, it's like, it felt weird. So that was the date. It was over. After that, it's the nighttime portion of the date, the cocktail party. And it does start out, I think, with Katie talking to Thomas and kind of asking him, so you mentioned a lot of red flags. So what's that about now? And then Thomas, he just continually talk circles and and Katie to her credit <laughs> I was kind of like yes girl she called him out on it which I'm also happy because whether or not maybe they actually do this on the show but within the past seasons but they you've never seen it on the show where a contestant's kind of talking and he's like no but I am here for you and I'm so happy to have this experience I'm open to it blah 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 and Katie's like you know, thank you for that. That's all really nice, but I feel like you're dodging my question. And I was like, yes, you're, you're right. He's dodging the question. And so then he kind of keeps talking and he, and, and she lets it go. And she's like, okay, <laughs> he still didn't really answer, but they seem to have like a good moment. Um, so the rest of the night is going on. She talks to people. It's, you know, whatever, it's fine. And then Thomas is like sitting there in the corner stewing and he's like, oh, I didn't answer her question. I messed it up, which, I think you, I think when you're like, get, feel like you're being caught in the lie is what was happening to Thomas. Like, you know that feeling when you kind of told a little bit of a, light, a white lie and then you realize, oh, I shouldn't have said that or I should have like followed it up with this or I should have like put in this detail and you're kind of like running through the conversation in your mind being like, oh, I should have handled this differently. But you can tell that's what's happening with Thomas and then he's like, okay, I'm going to go back and, and talk to her again. So he goes back, interrupts Aaron, which is dangerous because Aaron has not had an episode yet and it's continued where he's not had kind of some negativity surrounding him <laughs> like he is like a center for drama so I well I'm, I'm honestly probably pretty sure the producers told him to go interrupt Aaron but it's interesting that it was Aaron so Thomas goes back talks to Katie he he says he, he told the men that he was falling and told Katie he was falling in love with her. 
He doesn't really say those words per se, but he alludes to the fact that he's falling in love with her. They have a great moment. They kiss. Thomas goes back and joins the men, tells them, my time with Katie is more important than your time with Katie because I had something really important to tell her. All the other men were like, well, so did we, and you took that away from us. And then Thomas is like, well, I told her I was falling in love with her. And they're just like, that's manipulative. Why? It's too soon. Why would you tell her you're falling in love with her? Blah, blah, blah. All these men. Whatever. Drama. 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 So we need a break from the drama. We want something happy and uplifting. It's time for Michael's one-on-one -on -one date. Oh, Michael. <laughs> I really... I really like him. I really do, which is, I don't know, I he's not, personally, he's not really like my type, like looks wise, and he has a son, which I would definitely never be into because I do not like children, but I just found myself being like, wow, you're amazing. Like I have like this huge parasocial crush on you right now and I don't know why <laughs> but he says all the right things and he's sweet and you he's really coming off as very very sincere in everything he does which is adorable it's also adorable how he like gets a little bit nervous and I think it's cute how you ask Katie so many times like can I kiss you and he's like oh can I kiss you oh it's so cute oh it's really cute anyways so he and Katie go on this date they go four-wheeling and then they go out in the boondocks and they have this little like you know picnic with champagne and they're getting into the more personal stuff and Michael tells opens up to Katie about what it's like being a single father and how he feels like he needs to go on this journey in order to become you know his best self and to be fulfilled and have love in his life in order to be a better father for his son which is really sweet and Katie is of course eating it up um he says this I mean it's the perfect line it's it's perfect I always hear that this ends in an engagement but it it begins at an engagement I love that. I didn't know how amazing you would be. That's really beautiful. Um, Which is actually very smart. That is where it starts. Like, you don't really know this person that you're getting engaged to on the show. Like, you know them, but you don't really know them. You know, so getting to know them outside of this environment is, is the start of the relationship. And Katie's like, oh, I love that. But it is actually really true. So the date's going on so well, so well. And then kind of intercut in Michael's date, there's more Thomas drama. The men are starting to talk. Everyone's kind of like, we don't like Thomas anymore. And everyone's just kind of talking about like, Thomas is on the outs. Cut back to Michael's date. It's now the nighttime portion. And this is where Michael shares the story about his wife, Laura, and her battle with breast cancer. And it's it's really, it was really touching. I, it was, I, I was, I was tearing up. Like a, a lot, I was crying during this section. Um, and you'd already get, and I thought it was interesting that they already gave Michael an, an earlier platform, an earlier time to talk about his wife's passing during group date one and they kind of cut away from the group date and then it was Michael, Andrew M and Mike. They were all working out at the gym and then Michael tells them, he's like, oh, there's something I really need to share with Katie because I haven't had the time or opportunity. It's going to, you know, require more time, which is kind of, I guess, foreshadowing that he's going to get the one-on-one -on -one date. Um, so he tells them about his wife and her her battle with breast cancer and how they really fought for two years And I mean that just that's so tough and Katie of course to her credit She accepts it well and she realizes and she says I know I'll never replace Laura. She was your love um, But hopefully we can and I'm okay with that I'm not I'm not intimidated by the fact that you had this marriage ahead of time and this love and this son like that's not That's not something that worries me and Michael to his credit, he also says the right thing and is like, no, I understand that and what we will build is something new and exciting. It's not not trying to replicate what I had is something new. And then of course she offers him the rose and she's like, I realize that this rose has weight because I'm not offering it just to you. I'm also offering it to your son, which was like, oh, so cute. And Michael, Michael's like, oh yeah, I love that. That's adorable. Which if you remember from my original sleuthing video, I think this is, I think this will come back. <laughs> I think this is going to come back around when I'm pretty sure Michael is sending himself home because maybe he's not ready to move forward with introducing Katie to James. Okay, so I think this has some weight, but it's beautiful. They have a wonderful night. They end up like, you know, on the roof looking at stars, the end. So it's interesting the way that producers are choosing to 
edit Michael. So I gave Michael a complex personality, super positive five for this episode. And I gave him super positive because the, the music was romantic throughout the way that the other men reacted to Michael's story, the way he talked about it, the way Katie talked about it. Everything in this episode was positive, positive, positive towards Michael. I think it's interesting how you compare Michael's edit as a widower on this season of The Bachelorette to another widow on the, a season of The Bachelor. So that was Kelsey. Do you remember Kelsey from way back in Chris Soule's season? So she also was married before and lost her husband tragically pretty young. And it's just the way that the two people are edited. One, you can tell that when Michael talks about sharing my story with Katie, that was obviously a line that was fed to him by the producers because Kelsey also talked about the same thing. She talked about her amazing story, her wonderful story, and how she has to share this story with Chris. However, when Michael shared his story, <laughs> when he talked about his, his wife, and the way it was, it was framed was that they went through something very powerful together, and he went through heartbreak, and now he's trying to rebuild a life for himself and his son. However, with Kelsey, she was obviously being set up as the villain, and the way that it was, it was presented was that she was trying to capitalize and use her story, her heartbreak, the heartbreak of losing her husband as a tool to manipulate Chris and get more time with him. And hell yes, I'm getting a rose tonight. Stay tuned, Monday nights at eight. The love story unveiled. She also had this weird thing where she like pretended to faint or she felt lightheaded or whatever on the floor. And she like was laughing. She was like, oh, well, I'll sure get a rose now. <laughs> You know, it's it was shown as trying to be a manipulative thing. So I just think it's really interesting um, just to compare the edits and how people with ostensibly very similar, you know, backgrounds or histories or things that could have been portrayed similarly were portrayed completely different. And I just think that was very, very interesting. After Michael's one-on-one -on -one date, it's supposed to be group date two, but there's just not time left in the episode because of the rose ceremony that bled over, blah, 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 blah. The producers decide to lean into the drama. So they end up putting this like a long extended scene where all of the men are kind of gathered around and they confront Thomas about his manipulative behavior and his lies. And Hunter specifically asked Thomas, did you ever consider being The Bachelor? Which... I have to wonder if Thomas said something along those lines during his interview. If he ever said, oh yes, I'm interested in being The Bachelor. I'm just curious because Nick Vial said, you know, someone's here for a platform. Thomas did admit that he came there, you know, open-minded, not knowing what to expect and came for a platform. And then why would Hunter specifically say, did you ever think you'd be The Bachelor and call him out on it? I do want to do a, like a separate video completely about this topic because I think it's really interesting to look at the reality star to influencer pipeline and how does that work. Um, Cause I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, but it was definitely being portrayed in a negative way. And I think it's because of Thomas. He's a smooth talker. You can tell he's a smooth talker. You, you could tell he's also thinking about his image a lot through his conversations, which personally, I think you have to. If you're going to go on the show, you have to think about your image and how you're going to be portrayed. And I don't know why the other men are making such a big deal out of this, because I bet you anything that every single guy in that room at one point or the other has thought about well, I wonder if I could be The Bachelor. I, you, that's just, you have to, <laughs> you have to like, they had to have thought of that. I mean, it's just, it, it's, I think it's human nature, you know? But anyways, they end, they end the episode there with like drama, like Thomas wants to be The Bachelor. <gasps> Moving right along to episode four, it starts with the second group date. Katie talks about how she hopes that this is going to be fun, great time, no more drama. We're just going to have a really great time. And they actually do for the most part. So this was another truth or dare date, but really it was just dare during the daytime portion of the date. And then it's supposed to be go to the cocktail party and share your truth with Katie. So they had to do a bunch of things. They had to do, you know, um, they had to sweet talk Katie for a minute. They had to eat a whole bunch of carbs, which was hilarious. Um, 
especially Mike's reaction. It's just, oh man. Uh, <laughs> imagine not having eaten a carb in seven years. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> But he also looks like he looks like, and I don't look like me, so whatever. So just when you think it's all going to be fun and games and everything's great and there's no more drama, Trey decides to take a page out of the Carl Handbook and play the White Knight and tell Katie, Thomas is not here for the right reasons. You better watch out. <sighs> what happened to Trey? He started out so fun. <laughs> Like night one with the ball pit, he just seemed sweet and fun. And now it's like, I don't know, maybe he feels like at this point in the competition that his relationship is not progressing as quickly as maybe some of the other men. Um, you know, I had him as a middle of the road positive four night one. Then I dropped him down all the way to an under the radar two for episode two. So, you know, maybe he just wasn't really getting the time or the connection with Katie. So he felt like he had to kind of stir some drama. And... I also kind of want to, I guess this is as good a time as any to talk about it because after Trey brings this up, which I personally think Andrew West had the right attitude. He got angry that Thomas was bringing this up. He says Katie told them to trust her. And it does feel like by these men continually playing the white knight, feeling like they have to look out for Katie's best interests, that they have to protect her, that they have to keep her away from the bad men. You know, it's a guy's job to protect her art, and it's my job to create an atmosphere for Katie to feel secure and safe. That means that I need to do something about it. It does feel like they're taking a little bit of the agency away from Katie, which doesn't sit well for me. It feels a little bit sexist, and I don't love it because jumping ahead to the cocktail party, basically, instead of spending their time to talk about their relationship, getting to know Katie, to deepen their connection, so many of the men that night decided that they wanted to kind of follow Trey's lead because, spoiler alert, it worked out well for Trey. He got the group date rose. They wanted to talk about how they don't trust Thomas and they think that Katie should be looking out for herself. Or they should think how Katie should be looking out for him. And then they do it under the guise of I'm just looking out for Katie and trying to protect her, but it feels like they're trying to... It also feels like they're trying to control Katie, to manipulate her in a way. So it's just interesting that this this white knight trope continues to be perpetuated throughout The Bachelorette. And it just, it just feels sexist and icky to me and I really hate it. I really, really hate it. <laughs> Anyways, um, so that's the, 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 I jumped ahead to the cocktail party. I already said Trey got the group date rose. Nothing else really happens at the group date. And then there's some weird editing that happens. Um, so it's very obvious that it's weird editing. It's supposed to be framed as the next day or possibly even the day of the cocktail party that Tasha shows up at Katie's room and tells her that a man from my past has shown up and he really feels like that you and he would get along and hit it off. This, of course, we all know is Blake. <laughs> We've been waiting for this to happen all season since the preseason previews. Blake is showing up. I think it's a very interesting that they sent Tasha in because she has a past relationship with this man. I also think it's interesting that Tasha would not tell Katie who this was because she didn't want to give her any kind of like preconceived idea about this guy. She didn't want to like influence her decision in any way. But Taisha does provide her own opinion to Katie saying that like, I do think that you guys would get along. I think he's an amazing guy. And I truly feel like he is someone that has good intentions. And I know that that's something that we've been dealing with in the house. And I really feel like he can be that person for you. Which is just wild to me that she would say that and would, would basically influence Katie because, you know, in the the post world, the pre world, the outside world of this like reality show bubble, most couples pre dating apps met either through work, through church, grew up in the same neighborhood or were introduced through friends or relatives. And so for Tasha to come in and say, there's this guy that I know, and I actually think you would get along well, is kind of lending her support to this guy even though on one on one side of the mouth she's saying i don't want to inter interfere 
On the other hand, she really is. So I just thought that was really interesting. So Katie goes, she meets with Blake. It's Blake. Oh, I'm so shocked that, you know, they talked a little bit on Instagram, I guess, before coming on the show. But it sounds like they had much less of a relationship than did Nick Bio and Caitlin Bristow. Um, sounds like they had a very strong flirtationship going on before he joined the show where Katie and Blake, it doesn't sound like it was too much. I think it was very interesting how Blake actually came off very, very well in this episode. And even though he was not in it for very long, I ended up giving him an under the radar positive two. Because if you notice in this scene where Katie is first talking to Blake, she kind of expresses her concern being like, well, just a few months ago, you were dating two bachelorettes. First, you were dating Claire and you were like texting her during the lockdown. You were all in invested in Claire. Then she leaves. And then very quickly, you switched your emotions around and went all in very invested in Tasha. Katie does not bring up the fact, but I've heard around mostly through my friends on Discord that maybe I read it somewhere. I don't remember. I don't remember. But I, I heard that Blake was also kind of invested or chatting to potentially interested in dating at least three other women from Matt James's season and was like actively kind of trying to talk to them. I guess Katie was one of these women, but there were others as well. So I think Katie's concern about Blake being seen with all these different women is very valid. And I'm glad that she asked him about it. Um, I don't remember what his response was, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter what he says because what was really important was this in the scene is if you listen to the music cues again remember from before when I was talking about the music cues on night one with Michael the same thing is happening in this episode with Blake and I mean he's a very handsome guy I don't know I don't know I'm just still taking this all in right now you know like the last person I thought I'd see is you romantic music is swelling it's being he's being presented in a very positive way as a true viable romantic lead he's also kind of the way that they edit this oh and we'll talk about the editing oh my gosh so if you look at katie's outfit <laughs> she's wearing the same outfit that she was wearing on group date one so i really would love to know how the show was filmed because we did get a little bit of peek behind the curtain for the rose ceremony that it was midnight when Katie was starting the cocktail party for rose ceremony three. And it's midnight, brother. So we know that they film way into like the late night. We know that night one they film, cause they have to wait for hard night and then they film literally until like daylight, sunrise. So often that these rose ceremonies are ending when it's like dawn. Um, but I just, it's interesting, I wonder how late the cocktail parties go and then how early the next day do they actually start filming for the next, next group date or the next date. So I just wonder if it was like early in the morning before she started group date one or it was kind of between the group date and the cocktail party that Tasha comes and talk to her, talks to Katie. But you can tell it's the same day because she's wearing the exact same outfit. I also think it's interesting, and I mentioned this to my friends on Discord, but it's Nick Vial was hosting that group date. Caitlin Risto is a host on this show. I think it's fascinating that they didn't talk to any of these other past contestants about this experience of bringing in another man late to the show. Now, when I was right, they did bring him in in episode four. I kind of like salute that out in a past episode. Like, when are they going to bring Blake in? But I just think it's really, really interesting that Katie didn't talk to Caitlyn, and maybe she did and they just didn't air it, but I would seriously have like, if if someone is there and can provide you advice, like what was that like bringing Nick into this experience late and how did the other men, like, you know, the other men didn't react positively, but how did you handle that? How did you feel about it? They didn't talk to Caitlyn about it and they didn't talk to Nick, which I think it would have been so fascinating to hear from Nick about what his experience was coming on the show late. I don't know. I have a theory that it's possible well, one, they probably didn't do that because they didn't want to put, draw attention to the fact that they were editing this out of order. And there's probably, there's a couple reasons I think they did it. Probably just for flow and to try to break up the, the two episodes. They probably didn't want to have like Blake introduced in episode three and then have to wait all the way until the end of episode four for Katie to decide to like let him stay and join the house. 
So they probably wanted to keep it contained to one episode. Um, you can also tell when Katie is talking in her one-on-one -on -one and when she's also talking with Tasha, she talks about the drama and how difficult what last night was. Based on her outfit, we know that when she says last night, she was talking about the Carl drama and him saying that people weren't there for the right reasons and her being really upset. But in voiceover, and you'll notice it's, it's very, very obvious how they did it, that they, you never see Katie's mouth when she talks about not knowing if Thomas is there for the right reason. Waking up this morning after everything that happened last night, I feel like a fool. I really saw Thomas going far. It's all, you know, Katie's not looking at the camera and so she talks about, oh, it was so dramatic the night before, cut away. I don't know if Thomas is gonna be here. Everyone's saying Thomas isn't here, whatever, something like that. So you notice it's very obvious that they are using the editing to adjust the timeline, which is just, wild and crazy to me. While I'm feeling sorry for myself, there's a knock on my door and honestly the last person I expected to see was Tasha. Anyways, Blake comes in, has a really good edit, like I was very surprised. I was surprised that Blake has such a good edit. Uh, but he did. But Katie was like, you know, I'm having really strong connections with the other men. I don't know if I want to let you stay, so I'll let I'll think about it and let you know. It's the night of the cocktail party. She talks to Tasha and Caitlin first, which again, I'm surprised that she didn't talk about Blake in this episode, but they decide to focus the conversation on Thomas. It's interesting that Tasha and Caitlin both say pretty negative things about Thomas and how he was just trying to use Katie to get a leg up and try to increase his like visibility and his platform, which is fascinating that they would say that. So as soon as like, I think it was Caitlin who said it, as soon as Caitlin said it, I was like, okay, he's done. He's a goner. Thomas is cut off. <laughs> like he's, there's no more Thomas, but that's a lie. Before the cocktail party, Thomas shows up at Katie's door to try to talk to her more one-on-one. -on -one. He explains to her that yes, he said he thought about being the bachelor, but that's no longer the case. He would sign any document in the world saying he will not be the bachelor. He's just there for Katie. Katie's kind of like, okay, you know, I have a lot to think about. Thanks so much. I'll see you later. So he joins the cocktail party. Everybody's mad. It's drama. The men, I mentioned before, everybody talks. Well, not everybody. Most of the men talk about the Thomas drama. I think the only ones who really don't are that we're shown not talking about the Thomas drama was Michael, who continues to have a, a good connection with Katie. I gave him an under the radar positive. And then Andrew S, um, which unfortunately he had an over the top mixed rating for this episode just because he was getting into these like fights and like heated arguments with the other men about the Thomas drama. So he got sucked in a little bit, um, although he was in the drama because he said he didn't want to have drama. So I just thought that was interesting. And unfortunately he did kind of have a little bit of a mixed edit because of that. Anyways, the night is over. Katie's going through the rose ceremony. She has given out all of the roses. It's the final rose and everyone's waiting to see, is she going to give the final rose to Thomas? It's the last name. Katie picks up the rose. She looks ahead and she calls out Thomas. What? It was so shocking. Why would she do that? Anyways, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I probably rewound and watched so many times that Thomas steps up to give her a hug and Katie steps back, like very clearly, like, don't touch me. I'm over you. And then she gives the best, most amazing boss speech ever. That Katie's like, you're done. Your audition to be The Bachelor ends tonight. Get out. It was so great. So she doesn't give the final rose to Thomas, but one thing that I think was really interesting is that Katie also chose to not give that final rose to any of the other men. So on that night, um, Christian was sent home, which I'm kind of upset about because I kind of liked Christian. Like he didn't have a big role, but he had some really like funny lines. In a one, in a two, in a rip doo dee doo. I just kind of enjoyed his energy. I mean, I knew he wasn't gonna make it that far, but I enjoyed him for the time that he was on the show. In a one, in a two, in a rip doo dee doo. Um, Connor C, home, and also David. And I really, I liked David. I mean, he didn't have a lot going on. He was pretty under the radar, but I also just kind of liked him. Anyways, the total number in the house stays the same because after the cocktail party, Katie says, okay, I've decided that I followed my gut with Thomas. I'm going to follow my gut and I'm going to let Blake stay. She goes to his room. She tells him this is funny, cute moment. That was the whole are you naked thing. And he's like, oh, I just put on boxers. And it's only by now Katie's like standing there waiting for him. And she's like, what took you so long? And he's like, I had to get a mint. <laughs> I 
<laughs> then he locks himself out of his room. It was really funny. It was cute, kind of like endearing, heartwarming, sort of again, I think building towards something of of Blake making it farther, being a real contender. Like his edit so far, it's been romantic and now it's being like kind of silly and cute. And you know, that is something to look out for, for sure. So what I ended up doing with my edgic scores for week three and four, I did give individual scores for both episodes three and episodes four. And then I went ahead and I went back and I gave a combined edgic score for weeks three and four. Because to be honest, episodes three and four, it's, it's one week of, of dating. It's one, you know, week It's of, of dates of, you know, group date, one-on-one -on -one group date, rose ceremony. So I actually ended up combining the score. Because of that, some real contenders were invisible for one of the episodes. Like an Andrew S, because he was on group date two, was practically invisible for episode three. And so was Greg. Both of them, who I, I think are definitely final four contenders, were both invisible. And then the same kind of happened with Connor B in episode four, because he was on the first group date. So that's why I went ahead and gave them um, combined edu scores. I'll go ahead and put it up here if you want to take a look at it. Um, I just think it was sort of interesting. There's still a lot of middle of the road people. Uh, Aaron continues his over the top negative streak. Of course, Thomas over the top negative. Uh, Hunter starting to get pulled into that drama, got a mixed edit. So did Andrew S. Unfortunately, just because he got kind of tied up in the drama. Um, and Trey. I gave Trey an over-the-top negative too as well because he was starting to get mixed into that drama, but not to the extent that Aaron and Thomas were in the drama. So that was kind of my my thoughts on that. It's going to be a lot of drama for next week, just like looking at the trailer. It looks like there's going to be two one-on-one -on -one dates, two one-on-one -on -one dates, one with Andrew S, which I'm really excited about because I, I really do like Andrew S, so it'll be fun to see that date. And then a second date, one-on-one -on -one date with Blake, which is going to cause so much drama. And of course, that's why they're doing it. <laughs> so transparent. It's obvious. He comes into the house late. That's going to cause a lot of drama. And then for him to immediately get a one on one date, it's going to cause even more drama. Um, so, kind of a weird edit in the episode is that they're trying to make Hunter look like a villain which I really don't think he is. Um, cause the editing that they did in that trailer is, it's just, it's really misleading. Um, there's a couple things you can look out for. There's voiceover of Hunter that's not being shown. Again, his voice is not shown with him actually talking. Um, they're trying to make it look like he's the one that like hit, looks like Michael. The footage of Michael going down, taking a really hard hit and then the ambulance, it's making it look like Hunter is the one who hit Michael. But if you look at the color of their very revealing, very, make me very uncomfortable to actually look at outfits, like wrestling garb, Michael and Hunter are on the same team. So it just makes no sense that Hunter would tackle a teammate. And I don't think he did. I think they're just trying to make it look like he did for, I don't, well, I do, I don't really know why, but I guess it's because they feel like Hunter is expendable. Um, you know, the guys who are left who are expendable, it'd be Andrew M, but he's been so under the radar that it would be feel very jarring and strange that they would immediately try to turn him into a villain. Same thing with Josh. He's been really under the radar. Courtney, you could maybe see it, but it just, that's not his personality. Because Hunter got pulled into all of this Thomas drama, he's the most likely person that they could next sort of pull into a drama villain edit. Um, it'll be interesting to see. I don't think, because if you actually look in the trailer, there's a shot of of Hunter with Katie and he has a rose. So he probably received like, it looks like a probably a group date rose. So I don't think the actual episode is going to break down that Hunter is, is truly a villain, but it's just interesting that in the trailer, they're trying to make it look like it. I don't know, we'll see. Anyways, I'm gonna shut up. I've been talking for way too long, but I got really excited and yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like, what do you think about um, how the show is going to break down moving forward? I would love to love to hear about it. So go ahead and put that in the comments. Just remember, no outright spoilers in the comments. Um, only things that we can sleuth out or talk about with media analysis. So yeah. All right. That's everything. Thanks so much for watching, you guys. I hope you had fun. Uh, I had a lot of fun chatting about this. If you want to see more, uh, if you liked it, thumbs up that'd be cool and you know make sure that you're here for the right reasons go ahead and hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you'll be notified every single time that i upload all right i hope you guys have a fantastic day let's go watch the next episode of the bachelorette yay all right bye everyone <laughs>